Tonight's science presenter is Dr. Diane Columbelli Negrell. Diane is South Australia's only penguin ecologist dedicated to improving our understanding of little penguin populations and supporting their survival. Diane has previously worked with songbirds to seabirds, studying animal behaviour, prenatal learning, environmental conservation and birds' use of sound. She investigates ecological and behavioural factors that can influence penguin populations, which informs environmental management. She's recently collaborated with artists in the design and installation of new artificial nests to boost little peng penguin breeding success on Kangaroo Island. In this talk, she'll discuss the decline of the little penguin in South Australia, some of the challenges they face and how, they, how we can enhance conservation outcomes through collaboration between sciences and arts. I'll hand over to Diane now. Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Before I actually start my talk, I would like to thank everyone involved in this project uh, who helped collect the data, but also everyone who made this talk possible tonight for their contribution. So thank you everyone for making this happen and also thank you for you for listening. So tonight I'm going to talk about little penguins and I've entitled this talk Little Penguin versus the World because I'm going to show you that little penguin, especially in South Australia, are facing a lot of threats in the environment. I'm sure you're all aware that little penguin in South Australia are declining. So how could we explain their decline? This is part of my job, finding answers to this question. What threat are they facing? And how can we manage those threat, reduce those threat, so that we can help them thrive in the environment? And so, little penguins, as, you sh as I'm sure you know, interact both with the terrestrial environment and the marine environment. So they spend a lot of time at sea foraging for food, but they also spend a lot of time on land for breeding and molting, which means they have double the threat because they can experience a lot of threat at sea, but also on land. So when we ask questions such as, what factors can explain the decline of the little penguin? We need to look at factors at sea and on land. So today I'm going to talk to you about some of the factors that impact their survival, which mainly would be at sea but also on land, factors that impact their breeding success because obviously we want adults to survive but we also want them to be able to produce young. But before we go to that level, we also want to know how distinct are the population and do they interact. Because little penguins are not just one colony, there are actually a hundred colonies of little penguins in South Australia. Are they all declining? Is that just one big colony and they all interact with each other and all interchange with each other? So maybe we're not talking about decline, but movement. Maybe the birds are moving from one colony to another. Or should we really be concerned about the decline of some colonies because those colonies are very unique and we're losing very important birds? So let's start with the first one. How distinct are the population and do they interact with each other? So the first way we would do that in science would be to actually go to all the island, all the colonies, catch the birds and collect blood sample. So in Little Penguin we do that in the foot, as you can see in the photo. And this is what we did. We captured a lot of little penguins, collected blood samples, and then put all that in the lab and compare the genetics. And we did that across three different islands. Actually, four different islands. And the reason we did that around those islands is because this is where we know there's a lot of decline. We know that the little penguin in the Gulf of Vincent showed 80% decline. So we sampled on Granite Island, Truebridge Island, Althorp Island and all around Kangaroo Island. So we had several colonies around Kangaroo Island. And based on that, we expected that they all would be different or they would be all one big colony from a genetic point of view. And what we found was quite surprising 
because what we found is that granite island, alpha pollen, and the bottom part of kangaroo island was all one genetic colony. Then Truebridge Island was on its own. But the most surprising result was that Kangaroo Island, the top part of Kangaroo Island, Emu Bay in particular, was a bit of a hybrid, a hybrid between the blue population and the red population. So, first of all, we can say from a genetic point of view, we do have different population. And it seems like the one on Kangaroo Island at the top part of Kangaroo Island are quite unique, and this is quite important for later. But of course the birds do not take a blood sample from each other and test that in a lab to know whether they want to reproduce with a mate. They use vocalization and morphology. So we had to do that too. So we went out and measured the birds. And this is some of the measurements that we took. And then we recorded their vocalization. And what we found is that all the birds from all the different colony were different in terms of morphology and also were different in terms of calls. So you, I've put on the screen two of the main calls of the little penguin. One is called the bray, which sounds exactly like it sounds, a donkey bray. And the second one is a growl, a little bit like a dog growl. And both those calls varied between individuals, but also between colonies. So we could tell that the call varied, but do the birds care? You know, if you hear someone with a sexy accent, maybe you actually would prefer to mate with that person than with someone who sounds the same as you. So we asked the bird, does it matter that each colony has different calls? And turns out it doesn't. They responded to the bird the same way, regardless of the cause of origin. So the population is distinct. Yes, they have different genetic, different morphology, and even different calls. But when we tested the calls, we actually played back some calls from different colonies to the bird. They responded the same way. So it seems like it doesn't matter. So now let's talk about factors that impact adults and sub-adult survival. And we know from long-term study on Granite Island, which is an important colony for little penguins, that survival is very low. So once the birds leave the land to go at sea and forage, very few of them return. Now there's something you need to know about penguins in general and little penguins is that once they leave the nest, the young one, we call them fledgings, do not return back to the colony straight away. They would spend up to three years at sea learning to be penguins. They learn to forage, they learn to escape predators, and only after two to three years do they return to the colony to find a mate and breed. And what we could see is that the survival of the adults was very low, less than 16% in some years, which is extremely low. But the survival of the adult was even lower. You can see it's actually less than 5%. So it seems like in that first year, first few years before they're ready to breed, that those fledgings, those young ones, those juveniles are encountering a lot of challenges that compromise their survival. Let's take a short art break now and enjoy this fantastic mural by local South Australian artist Barbary O'Brien. On the walls of this former cheese factory in Brompton in inner suburban Adelaide, Barbary has painted a spectacular wraparound mural called Towards the Light. You can find it at the intersection of 5th Street and Hayman Street. We're showing it here because it shows little penguins as part of a dynamic and diverse ecosystem, complete with bottlenose dolphins, schools of baitfish, and healthy seagrass beds. On the 5th Street wall, cormorants and terns dive into the water from above, little penguins are foraging, and seals or sea lions are looking for a meal. 
On the seabed, Barbary has painted kelp and seagrass, critical habitats for so many species of fish and invertebrates, and home to South Australia's marine emblem, the leafy sea dragon. You can see more of Barbary's artwork at surfgardenstudio.com. Now back to you, Diane. So we want to know more. What could be those challenges? What could be the factors reducing their survival? And to do that, we did some carcasses analysis. So this is a project that we do in collaboration with the SA Museum, where we collect a lot of carcasses all across South Australia. And then some necroscopy analysis is conducted on those carcasses to give us an indication of the type of um, death, the reason for the death. And from that, we can look at whether it was a trauma, malnutrition, others would generally be disease or pathogens. But within trauma, we can even go further because we can look at whether it's from marine predation. So this would generally come from underneath, so be on the belly, or from terrestrial predation, so t predators on land. And these would generally come from the neck above the bird. And sometimes we can't tell because there's not enough left. All we have is a flipper or a foot. So that is not enough to tell us what happened. But from this analysis, we can tell that 80% of the bird died as a result of trauma. 30% to 40% due to predators, marine predators, and 20 to 40% due to terrestrial predation. So this is a question I get asked a lot. Well, what about the fair seal? Because a lot of people think fair seals are the main factors responsible for the decline of the little penguin. Well, we needed to ask, we needed to investigate that. And one way we can look at is to look at what are the fair seal eating after they've eaten their diet. So to do that, we need to actually collect scats, which is poo of fair seals and analyze what's the content of those scats. And before this study, we knew a little bit about their diet. We knew that individuals at the breeding site, females and dominant males or breeding males, were foraging on squid, red bait, and other fishes. This is mainly the diet of the females, What males were mainly foraging on penguins, squid, and red bait. So we knew there were some differences between the males and the females, but we only knew about their breeding, uh, their diet at the breeding sites. Seals, when they're not breeding, spend a lot of their time in a hole outside. So those sites are for younger males, males that are not dominant, not males that are not breeding. This is kind of like a bachelor pad. And because we know that the breeding males tend to target penguins, we were interested in the diet of those juvenile males. So we went across a lot of different areas, lots of different seals, uh, hole outs and breeding sites, and you've got a map on the screen showing you the different location. So in yellow we have all the hole outs on Kangaroo Island, in red, we have the two breeding colonies. There's only breeding colonies on Kangaroo Island. We also sampled some uh, scats along the coast of the Flurio Peninsula and in the York Peninsula near Port Giles, which is next to Truebridge Island, which is a large penguin colony. So we collected those scats and then we analyzed them for the content. And then we divided that into fishes, squid or penguins. Penguins were very easy to find because we could see some feathers. We had like a big chunk of feathers within the scats. For the others, we had to look at bones and eyes and any remains that could tell us which animal it was, whether it was a fish or a squid or a little bit left of the penguin like a foot. And what we found is that the amount of penguins remain found in the scats actually varied between the colonies or the whole outside. 
So don't look at all the different locations. What you need to see in blue are all the locations that we sample on Kango Island. In this, you could find little penguin remains in 4% of the scats. In purple are the areas of colonies for seals where we sample next to the York Peninsula, so Port Island, next to Trowbridge Island. In this case, 10% of the scats had evidence of little penguins remain. And in black circle in red are the areas that we sampled next to Granite Island. And in this area, there was 42% of the scats contained evidence of little penguin remain. So this tells us that the presence of little penguins in the diet of the fur seal varies between location. And the fact that they might be next to a large penguin colony doesn't necessarily drive predation because the largest colony is near Trowbridge Island, is Trowbridge Island, which is next to Port Giles. So we could have expected to find more little penguin presence in these cats in the Port Giles area. But we actually found more next to Granite Island. But one thing we need to consider, obviously, is how long does it take for one seal to digest a little penguin? Because obviously, when you find a scat, two scats, three scats with feathers, does that mean it is three penguins? Or the same penguins digested over several days? So these are the kind of questions that we're still trying to answer. Another important factor for little penguin decline is predation on land. So obviously once they're at sea, they have to escape predators, marine predators. I mentioned the seals, they also can be predated upon by sharks. But when they arrive on land, they're not necessarily safe. They have to face other predators, and in particular, introduced predators, so predators that were not native to Australia. And this is the example with cats and foxes. And little penguins are very susceptible to those kind of predators because they have a slow locomotion. They're not very adapted for the life on land. So you can imagine a slow penguin facing a very quick cats or foxes. And so those footage on the left, you have photos of cats checking little penguin burrows. These were taken on Kangaroo Island. And not all those cats were feral cats. Some of them had collars, so they were actually um, cats belonging to people. And the photos on the right were taken on Granny Talent, where we had two foxes in 2020, uh, predating two thirds of the little penguin colony on Granny Talent. So the issue with those cats and, and foxes and dogs as well can be an issue, can predate on little penguin, is they are what we call surplus killers. So they will kill way more than what they need. And so this is why a single fox, a single dog, can kill up to 17 penguin in one night. This is why they're making a lot of impact on the populations. So, so far we talk about how distinct are the population and I've discussed that they are distinct. We talked about factors that impact their survival whether they are at sea or on land. But we also need to talk about their breeding success. And why is it important to know about breeding success? Well, let's take the example of those two colonies. We have one large colony. We've got lots of adults, 200 adults, and every year they produce 80 fledgings, 80 young. And you compare that big colony against a small colony where you have 10 breeding pairs and every year they produce 10, 8 young. So if you just look at your numbers, you might think, well, the large colony is doing really good. We don't really need to worry about that. We need to focus all our effort on the small colony. But actually, if you look at the numbers a little bit more closely, from a breeding success point of view, the large colony, the big colony, is not doing really well. They only have a breeding success of 40%. So what I mean by breeding success is the amount of young produced 
in relation to the amount of adults, the breeding adults. So what these tell us is that for the bee colony, the breeding success is low, but adult survival seems to be pretty good. So here we want to manage the nesting condition, manage their breeding success. But in the case of the small colony, their breeding success is actually 80%. So these tell us that there are not many adults. Their survival is not very great, but their breeding success is amazing. So there's not many of them left, but whoever is left are champions. So in this case, what you would want is manage the adult environment, ensure that those pairs can survive from one year to another to continue to produce a lot of chicks. Hello. My name is Michelle Fleur and I'm an artist and illustrator from Brisbane in Queensland um, and I'm inspired by the natural world as lots of creatives are, I'm particularly inspired by marine life. I love painting marine life and I love painting them in watercolours and I also do lots of pen and ink drawings of whales. Whales are my, probably my favourite creature. But this painting is of little penguins and I painted this a few years ago after seeing them on Penguin Island in Western Australia and then we made a trip across the bottom of Australia and we saw them a few times in various different places. So this painting was inspired by those sightings. I just thought they were the most delightful little creatures, wonderful to watch. So here's an example based on Granny Talent. So on Granny Talent we look at breeding success across 17 years. That colony has been monitored since 1990, quite regularly for breeding. And if we look at the breeding, you can see, so these are the grey bar on the screen, on the graph on the left. The grey bars vary quite a lot. So you can see that the number of fledging produced per pair varies between 0.6 in some years to um, less than 0.4 in 2001 and then it went up again and you can see in 2013 it was like going towards 1.6 1.8 and I can tell you that in recent years it even went higher than two so that means that a single breeding pair can produce up to two chicks right on a regular basis so lots of variation into the breeding success but we wanted to know why. Why is there such a big variation? Could it be that when there was a lot of them, we had too many and they were competing with each other? Or could something else explain this change? So now I want you to look at the black line. The black line is actually the predation. So what research found is that rats were actually predating on the eggs and the chicks of the little penguins. So you've got a photo on the right where you've got a bird who gently moved away for the photo to show us the two eggs that he was incubating. And you've got a photo of two chicks as well, which are close to fledgings. So those eggs and those chicks were being predated upon by rats. But you can see that the black lines start to decrease after 2008 and from 2008 to 2010 there's a sharp decline and then you reach zeros. So what happened then is that there was intensive rat control. So as a result of the research finding out that rats were an issue, they put in place some intense rat control on the island and that led to a decrease in the rat population and an increase in the breeding success on the island. So this is a bit of a success story. So this is where the predator control happened and this is dropped down, the predation dropped down to zero following that time. Now what about in other colonies? Are they all subject to rat predation? Well, this is another example at Emu Bay this time, Emu Bay being the colony on Kangaroo Island, the one that said where I showed you the individuals were slightly different due to their genetics. Well, in this case, they didn't have any issue with rat, but they had an issue with cats, but also guanas. And here you can see some evidence from, photo, from video cameras set up at the nest of guanas predating on penguins. And in this case, the guanas had a very interesting behaviors because they didn't predate on the eggs at all. They didn't predate on the young chicks. They only predated 
the older chick. But they still visited the Paro at several stages. So you can see here the number of visits of the guanas across these different stages. So you see at the egg stage, not a lot of visit. Then as the chicks get a bit young, or they just after hatching in that younger stage, so we're talking about two to three weeks, the number of visits of the guanas increased. But then after that, the number of visits increased even further. And this is because the guana kept visiting the burrow again and again until the chicks were old enough to be left alone, so to be without their parents, and also fat enough. It's a bit like you opening your fridge again and again until you know you have a dish waiting there and you know that it just needs several hours to be ready to be good, to be like ready to be eaten. And the same thing, the guana was checking his fridge, in this case the penguin borrows repeatedly to see where his food was at. And when the food was ready, the guana would settle in the burrow and devour the two chicks. Another important factor to mention with little penguins and breeding is the nest type. So you can see with all the photos on the screen, little penguins actually nest in a lot of different type of nests. Some of, this, some of them nest on the surface, some of them dig their own burrows, some of them like to nest under vegetation, others like to nest between rocks, and then there's another category that like to nest in artificial nests that are made by human, constructed by human. And the importance of that is that depending on where they nest, they can have higher or lower hatching success or breeding success. So if they nest in rock nests, the one highlighted in red, they have a higher chance of their eggs hatching and producing chicks, and they've got a high chance of their chicks actually fledging and leaving the nest. But if they nest in the artificial nest, the one now in red, they have a higher chance of actually overheating and engaging in those maintenance behavior, which is like pruning behaviors, behaviors they engage in when they get really, really hot. Because remember, little penguins breed during winter all the way to summer months. So during those summer months, they can get quite hot in their burrows. So the type of nest they use can be quite important for not only their breeding success, but also their own fitness. So this leads us to this idea of science meets the art and how the combination of the two can actually help little penguins. And the story starts with the artist, Jane Bonfort, who actually worked in science and art before the Little Penguin Project. So she's well known for designing the ceramic artificial spawning habitat for the spotted handfish. So there's a photo at the bottom of the screen of those uh, habitats. And then you have a photo on the left showing actually this, the uh, spotted handfish using the habitat. And the idea was that this um, species of fish is actually critically endangered and they were declining in particular because they lost their habitat for spawning. And the scientists at the time were replacing, giving them um, habitat, but using plastic, which is kind of not a good idea to introduce plastic in the environment when you're trying to actually remove it from the environment. So they contacted Jane, who is a clay artist, so she could design some habitat made out of clay so that it would be not detrimental to the environment and could actually help the spotted handfish. And it actually did, it made a significant improvement into their conservation status. So from this idea and from her work with those researchers, Jane decided to put her attention towards little penguin. And this is where we started collaborating, her and a lot of other people uh, from a lot of different organizations, where we actually, she decided to design little penguin nests, little penguin burrows, to improve the nesting condition. 
So to give them actual nests, but actual nests are better designed so that they can improve their microclimate, but also maybe, hopefully, reduce predation. So as I mentioned, they could be predation by cats, they could be predation by guanas. And so the idea is that some of those actual burrows might have a specific design that would prevent entrance from a guana by having a zigzag entrance or not allow a cat to dig under the entrance by having a bit of a ladder. So all that is integrated into the design of the burrows to hopefully reduce predation but also give the penguins better ventilation so you can see this little extremities sticking out of the burrows that actually have holes underneath and that allow good ventilation to provide better microclimate. So all those are made out of clay and um, have been designed by Jane. So that was the art part because she made those into pieces of art. And where from a science point of view, we actually decided to put them into habitat and asked birds, does it work? Do you like those burrows? Would you use it? How good is a microclimate? Does that reduce predation? So we decided to choose Kangaroo Island, Kangaroo Island, Emu Bay in particular. And why we chose this colony is for several reasons. First of all, there's a lot of artificial nests on that island and some of them are poorly designed. You can see the one on the screen has black plastic container which is really bad for the birds because they can overheat under this plastic uh, surface. The other interesting part is that it's a population that has shown decline in the past but it's stable at the moment so we have a good number of birds that we can test, we can ask. But also as I mentioned before it's a unique population. The research showed that they have unique genetics but also unique calls and unique morphology. And they also have a different foraging habits. So it's quite a unique colony to preserve. And they experience predation by cats and guanas. So it's a perfect combination to test all the ideas that we want to test. And so this is um, news from last week where we actually unpack the first burrows to install it on Kangaroo Island at Emu Bay. And this is uh, the burrow hidden in the vegetation so that it's of a good habitat for the birds. And we actually have the first evidence that some birds have been um, visiting the area. So we are really hopeful to see how they're going to use that. And we do that by having little video cameras so we can see whether the birds are using the burrows, whether other animals are visiting the burrows. And we also have little buttons inside the burrows that uh, record the microclimates. And that would tell us whether the microclimates of those particular burrows, those new burrows, are, is actually better or worse, hopefully better, than others uh, in the colony. So other artificial burrows and also other natural burrows. And so here is the first collaboration of... Um, Little Penguin and Art and Conservation, looking at how art and science can meet together to improve conservation of, an, of a seabird species. And so this is the end of my talk. Uh, thank you so much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the talk. Thank you everyone again for making this talk possible. And if you have any question. I will be happy to answer them through the chat or even if you want to contact me directly. Thank you so much for listening.